is. Thank you. Now I know you guys can see me. Uh, thank you all for signing on. And hey, Kate, I will see you all in just a minute. I'm just going to stop the recording so that we'll be able to do a clean recording of this. Oh. Oh, thank you, Yvonne. Okay, good. Thanks, Caroline. I'm glad you can. Okay, so I see people with raised hands. Let me just see what do we have here. Raised hands, just see some things in chat. Good. Okay, so everybody can hear. And um, let me just go back to this for a minute. All right, so we are just about ready to get started. It is 3.01 and we're going to go into our second session of uh, Fair Housing, It's a New World. And I'm Jackie Casera, in case you weren't with us last week, and I'm delighted that you're all here. And, uh, and thank you, I can see that you can hear now and that everything is good. And so I'm going to be sharing my screen with a PowerPoint. We will also send you uh, copies of the PowerPoint if you guys would like that, just let me know here in the chat. And I am going to share the screen to get the PowerPoint on, and then we will, uh, we will begin. Okay, so Fair Housing, It's a New World, Part Two. So for those of you who were with us last week, uh, you know that we talked quite a good bit about the, fair the definition of fair housing, the definition of civil rights and diversity. And I had the opportunity to have some dialogue with Susan Summers, who's one of our very fine agents and an associate broker in our Loudonville office. And Susan shared with me um, some wonderful ideas about what fair housing means to her. And I think Susan's probably on today's broadcast. And uh, I wanted to share them with you because I think it's a really good definition that we should all keep in mind when we're talking about fair housing. F in fair housing means to Susan, the freedom to choose a neighborhood with good schools and a quality of life. A, all are entitled to this freedom of choice. I, I, as a realtor, play an integral part in seeing this equality of choice is accomplished every day. R, repair the damage that has been done by past and current discrimination. H, heal the discrimination gap in housing by my own actions. O, out them when I hear people start stating discriminatory and prejudicial remarks. U, Understand that discrimination is existing in many subtle and less subtle ways and do my part to end it by my actions. S, show everyone housing options equally. I, inequality hurts everyone. N, never tolerate injustice. And G, good practice making sure all clients and customers are made aware of all housing options. So Susan, thank you for that. And I think it really raises top of mind some of the things that we have to remember, uh, not only about fair housing, but about our ethical obligations, about the things that we commit to by virtue of our profession and our membership in our professional uh, organizations from NAR to our state boards and organizations uh, down to our local boards. And that has to do with that we are the only ones who can start changing some of these things. We are the only ones that can bring a heightened level of professionalism and a heightened level of awareness and compassion to the things that are going on in, in the marketplace, actually, that have to do with those things that we have concerns about. And let's see. Uh, we have some objectives for today. There's my dashboard. I've been wondering where my dashboard has disappeared. It just lowered itself. Uh, so our class of objectives for today, we're going to do a quick review of some of the things that we talked about last week. And we're going to take a look at the coming housing market. Who's going to comprise the coming housing market? And which groups of people are going to be emerging that maybe we haven't necessarily seen in large numbers before? I'm going to take a quick look at the census. The U.S. Census is a uh, a means for us to get a plethora of good information about who lives in America, what the trends are in the United States, 
and we know that we have a new census coming out in 2020. The last full census that we can rely on, of course, it's an every 10 years project, but they do updates in between as well and we get some inf information in that um, intervening gap. So we'll take a look at census figures and what we know about our macro market in the USA and about the specific markets in which Howard Hanna operates. We're going to take a nice look today at America's foreign born population the impact that persons born in other countries and emigrating to the United States have had on us as a nation and uh, where we are now with a number of issues that relate to that. And then finally, we're gonna wrap up on a little bit lighter note with some discussion of niche marketing and uh, just a brief overview of what we'll be talking about next week. So for the review, I just wanna go over some important things that we covered. The first one was the concept of intent versus impact. And the fact that you can have the world's best intentions and yet the impact that you have on the people with whom you come in contact may not be what you or they would prefer it to be. And so we have to always approach our intent with that impact in mind. And the law can't judge intent. The law can only judge the impact that it has on the people with whom we're working. So. Uh, so please keep that one in mind. And if you keep it front of mind and think, I know my intentions are good, what is the impact that this will have, that my actions will have, then we'll all be in much better shape relative to this topic. The second thing is patterns of practice. We talked a little bit about the idea that when you are called into accountability based on fair housing concerns, the first thing that the people will be sitting in judgment on that topic will look at is what have you done with everyone? Not just with the test subject or perhaps the checker that you may have encountered in this one-time incident, but what was your pattern of practice working with everyone? And that one pertains especially heavily to issues that have to do with what are we asking people for? The things that they discovered in that Long Island study, the, the uh, discrimination study that Newsday uh, newspaper undertook in Long Island for a three year period. And again, that study, even though it was not necessarily statistically meaningful, it used a relatively small sampling of companies, just 12 real estate brokerages and uh, under 100 real estate agents. But it was anecdotally meaningful because the patterns were there. And you could see the patterns of practice and subsequently the patterns of discrimination that came forth in the course of doing that study. So one of the areas where we have the biggest concern, of course, is who are we asking for pre-approval? If we're only asking a certain group of people or some people that we individually may suspect may not be pre-approved or may not qualify for a mortgage, and we're only asking them to please obtain pre-approval, we are de facto discriminating. And so we have to be super careful. I did a, a quick fair housing class yesterday for one of our new markets for our, our uh, fast start class. And I asked, uh, does, you know, every, does this apply to everyone? And the answer that came back was a really good one. Yes, if you're going to ask one person for pre-approval, you have to ask everyone for pre-approval. And so we got into the discussion of, do you have to show houses to people who are not pre-approved? And the answer came back, if you choose to show houses to people who are not pre-approved, then you need to show houses to everyone who is not pre-approved. And so my recommendation for us across the boards, we all have loan officers, mortgage loan officers at our disposal through our lenders, our in-house lenders, Howard Hanna Mortgage, First Priority Mortgage, Town Mortgage, the people that we work with every day and sit with in the office space we occupy those are the people that you can and should be taking somebody to for pre-approval just as a matter of course. It's not insulting. People will eventually need this and it makes them stronger buyers. So that is a particular soapbox that I jump on at every corner of the road because I know that this is the biggest area where discrimination or what appears to be discrimination is causing some problems. And so uh, let's just see what we have here in the chat room with people uh, raising hands. Let's see. Chat, where are we with chat? Oh, come on. Okay, let's see. 
uh, do I have a shareable document for the, uh, a shareable document? This will be a shareable document, uh, Roman. I'm not sure what you're asking for. Maybe just put something in the Q&A about shareable documents and tell me what you'd like and we'll get them for you. And I agree with you, Michael, that fair housing makes us all stronger. Glad to see that you're on this call. And intent versus impact, again, can't minimize the importance of that. So please keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, let's see. Okay, did you know that gender, race, color, ethnic background, age, religion, sexual orientation, these so-called minorities are soon going to make up the majority of our population. In fact, I'd be surprised if we're not already there. I'm hoping that that's one of the things that the US Census in 2020 is going to call to our attention. America's foreign born residents topped 43 million people in 2018, and 13.4% of the US population is now comprised of people who were born in other countries. So here's the real shocker. Salsa now outsells ketchup in the United States. Salsa has become our condiment of choice in the USA. So that may be shocking news for those of you in Pennsylvania who have Heinz right in your backyard. But, uh, but it's really interesting because it does bespeak literally an American appetite for a greater diversity in the things that we see and in the things even that we eat. So Hispanic and Asian populations are now expanding outside of urban areas in greater numbers. What we used to see on an ongoing basis was that people would come first as immigrants into cities, that's still pretty much the case, and they would live in multi-unit dwellings and uh, obtain employment. And as soon as they would get employed, save some money and be able to move out a little bit further for a little bit more breathing room, a little bit of space outside the city in suburban or even exurban areas, they would do that. That is now happening again, as it has happened on the continuum for when the United States, from when the United States was founded. But now it's happening with different groups of people. And so we're seeing that in metropolitan areas, not only are we seeing more Hispanic and Asian people, we're seeing that uh, we now have something that they're calling a majority minority population, meaning children under the age of 15 in a lot of these major cities. Persons under the age of 18 now comprise fully a quarter of the United States according to the 2010 census. So again, that's another figure that we're really gonna be keeping an eye on in the coming months. The white population has declined in 111 metropolitan areas. So I'm going to go back here to the chat room for a second and just ask all of you, give me some thoughts on, uh, on how you perceive this. Somebody just asked if cash buyers have to provide proof of funds before working with us. Yes, you should be requiring, if they say they're cash buyers, you should be requiring exactly that verification of funds from a qualified lender who is their banker and who can verify that they have enough money in whatever account to be able to buy that house. So uh, let's see, for some reason, I'm not able to get to the thing where it says uh, people are raising hands. That's just not showing up the way I would like it to. Okay, so, all right. So the computer's a little bit wonky today. So anything, anything in chat? Let's see if there's anything. I can see. Sorry, guys, if you're raising hands, I'm not able to get to it for some reason. It's just not opening up. Somebody, um, Helen, hello, just said, is there an issue if I get a call in the office and show homes to someone not approved and the next caller gets a different agent and that agent won't show unless pre-approved? That would probably be an issue for us as a brokerage, but you are all independent contractors. And so it would be something that across the boards, I can tell you that we, Howard Hanna, as a brokerage, would like everybody to be seeking pre-approval from every buyer who comes our way. And it's a terrific part of that baseline, but it is still at your individual discretion if you're going to seek pre-approval, if you are going to copy someone's driver's license. The one thing I can tell you is an absolute must is that individually, 
you absolutely must be consistent in your own individual practice. But yes, we as a broker would much prefer that everybody is practicing this particular thing by getting pre-approval from everyone. Uh, Sarah Loftus just said, I think that there are more interracial families, so that leads to more ethnicities in the area. Absolutely correct. And so what we're going to take a look at is a little bit of the housing pattern that uh, that actually emerged from and where it came into being for all of us. So in the beginning of the United States, starting in 1619, people began arriving by ships. This was not a happy arrival. This was not the arrival of people thinking they were coming to a promised land. These were, of course, the arrival of the first slaves who were brought to America. This is another project that has been developed this time by the New York Times. It's called Project 1619. And it talks about the first African landing on the shores of the United States. And if you are a podcast listener, I can't recommend this podcast highly enough. It's outstanding. And somehow just immersing yourself in the sounds of this project and the dialogue of real people who are either the ancestors of those slaves, uh, I'm sorry, whose, whose ancestors were those slaves, the heirs of those ancestors, or people who have been touched by slavery in their personal lives and by everything that it meant. And of course, last week we talked about the origin and, uh, and eventual application of fair housing laws and everything that that involved. But this is really where the need for that began in this country. And it was uh, not a happy arrival for these folks. It re-examines the legacy of slavery in the United States and what it means for all of us, the impact of that. It was timed for the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first Africans in Virginia. And it's exceptionally well-researched, fact-checked, and very compelling. So if you are a podcast listener, again, if you're not a podcast listener, just put in Project 1619 into a, a search on Google and it will pull up lots and lots of interesting topical things that you'll want to discuss. Okay. All right, so we move on to the 19th and 20th century with everything that was in between that, the profusion of slavery that took over. And we get in this time period into what became a European centric, a Eurocentric immigrant uh, base. If you look at the picture on the left, that good looking guy in the dress is my dad. And it's really kind of fun. Um, that is a picture of my grandmother. This picture was taken in 1912. My dad was born in, uh, oh, actually it was probably before 1912. He was born in 1908. So this is probably about 1910. But that period between, you know, the, the earliest part of the, 21st, uh, the 20th century and about 1920 was huge in terms of immigration in this country. So we started off as a melting pot. If anybody had um, family who came in through Ellis Island and moved to various parts of the country, usually to follow other family members, you may have had relatives who sought to learn how to speak English very quickly, or somebody like my Aunt Adeline who never learned to speak English. She spoke Italian till the day she died. <coughs> Excuse me, gang, hang on one second. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Here on the chat, Roman said, <clears throat> when Irish Catholics came to America in the 1800s, high discrimination was experienced. And uh, the more agents can, <clears throat> I'm so sorry. And of course, this is being recorded. Uh, let's see, Susan said, the more agents can educate themselves and embrace and learn about different cultures the stronger we will become. Fair housing makes us stronger. I'm not weeping, although the topic will lead me to tears, but my spring allergies seem to have just kicked in, so I apologize to all of you. The reason that I put in E.L. Doctorow's Ragtime in there, if you have never read that book, it's such a perfect uh, description of what was happening in this country at the early part of the 20th century where the people who had moved into kind of dominant business and political positions among the white ruling class 
first encountered African-American people coming up from slavery and into being free people living in, in uh, the New York area. This actually takes place in uh, New Rochelle, New York. And the European and Jewish immigrants coming in across Ellis Island. So if you haven't read Ragtime, I recommend it. <clears throat> if you're looking for a great movie, it also made a terrific movie with an all-star cast to recognize. And in my personal opinion, it is one of the absolutely finest American musicals ever made. So chat about that if you guys would like to and uh, take a look at what that means again for all of us. But what happened was that the US moved from this melting pot mentality where people wanted to assimilate into the majority and moved over into what we call a mosaic. And Jimmy Carter coined that beautifully. He said, we become not a melting pot, but a beautiful mosaic, different people, different beliefs, different yearnings, different hopes, and different dreams. And that's really where we are now. It's really where our country has gone in trying to accommodate that, yes, people all want to live here. Of course they do, because we are by far the best place in the world to build a life of freedom. If you've been oppressed, if you have been denied privileges that we have here, but at the same time, people don't necessarily want to move the, to lose those distinctions that make them who they are <coughs> and distinguish them in the world and in the market. Okay, let's see this chat once again. I have the amazing disappearing screen here. Okay. Um, Roman said, when my family came from the Ukraine, they were labels as DPs, displaced people. Yes, that was something that lots and lots of people experienced. Roseanne says, I came from Italy when I was three years old. It's a sensitive subject to me. I bet it is. It was sensitive to, to my family members who migrated from both Italy and Ireland. Mike said, my parents shared many stories of how they were treated when they immigrated from Sicily in 1933. And that's certainly true. Because what we go through when we're coming to a new country, there's always a group who's arrived before you. And so those immigrants who came over literally on the Mayflower and on other ships as well, were by that time, by the time the early 20th century rolled around and people, especially from our market areas, were coming in through Ellis Island, there was oppression of each subsequent group that came into the United States. And it ended up being really problematic for the Irish, for the Italians. And so I have to ask you, what's different now? What's different now? We're seeing different patterns of immigration and we're seeing people coming in through different borders than the ones that they came into at that time in history. But if you think about it, we have had a foreign born population continuing on a quest to live here and to be part of the United States and in many cases seeking to obtain citizenship. And what's happened that's different is that from 1970, we've seen an increase in size from 4.7% of the US population being foreign born to 2018, where 13.5%, about 43 million foreign born people came into the country and lived here. The total US population now of about 322 million people. If you take a look at who's a, natural, a, a native born US citizen, that comprises about 279 million. Naturalized citizens who have come in and assumed American citizenship is about 20.7 million. Legal non-citizens, those folks who are on green cards and are here legally is about 13.2 million. And unauthorized immigrants, the people who are not in the country legally, 11.3 million. Temporary visas also comprise a portion of this at 1.7 million. But of course, it's that area of the unauthorized immigrants that continues to make headlines in our country every day. And we take a look at that as part of the whole. And this quest, this quest to be part of those huddled masses yearning to be free continues unabated. So if you look now at who's come into the country, in 1960, 75% of those immigrants were still coming in from Europe. So from the time that Ellis Island was first open and the people were first coming across from European countries, 
75% as in the time that you know falls into most of our lifetimes, 1960, she said as an older person, many of our lifetimes. Um, but 75% came from Europe. Now, in 2017, a full quarter of the people coming in came from Mexico. Even more, 27.4% came from Asia. 25% came from other Latin American company, countries. So between Mexico and the other Latin American countries, that is about half of the immigrants coming in. 13.2% now come in from Europe and Canada and 9% from that great mass of elsewhere. And so you can see how that's changed and how the country of origin has changed and how it has perhaps taxed our systems. And uh, let's see what this is. This is just something popping up on my screen. I have no idea why it's there. I want it to go away. Okay. Oh, my computer. It's telling me my computer wants to restart. Pardon me, restart. Timing couldn't be worse, but it's telling me I'm about to be logged off, guys. If I get logged off, I will uh, come right back in and I do not want this to happen. Let's see. Okay, so this could be something where you just stay put and I will log back in after my computer restarts if that happens, but I may have some time. So just if that happens, don't go anywhere, I'll be back. This is just like technology meltdown day. Okay, so where do we go with this question of what happens with home ownership among immigrant people? 50.7% of the foreign born population have become homeowners. That compares pretty favorably with 65% of US born heads of household. If we look since the downturn in the market in the 2007-2008 uh, period, at home ownership's optimal point being somewhere between 63 and 66%, 50.7% of the foreign born population owning homes is a pretty impressive statistic. And so it bespeaks an interest on the part of people who migrate to this country to fully become part of what we traditionally think of as the American dream. The American dream used to be something that was captioned for home ownership. And if you look at this chart over on the right side of the screen, we talk about housing as one of the basic needs. It's kind of a like Maslow's hierarchy when you look at the things that people are looking for. And certainly they want that, that personal edification, that personal pride and freedom, but that ability to own your home and to own the land on which your home is built, if it's a single freestanding home, um, that's incomparable in this country. <clears throat> Excuse me. So immigrants are also becoming homeowners at a faster rate than the United States born population, which is kind of interesting. The US uh, population has been sort of flat in home ownership, but the immigrant population has risen about 2.3% in the years between 1994 and 2015. So it's not a lot of a blip, but it certainly does bespeak the idea that that desire for home ownership is certainly there and continuing and growing. And that for many people, that's why they wanna be here. A study was conducted also at the University of Washington that estimated that immigrants contribute about $3.7 trillion to housing markets nationwide. So that's pretty impressive. Now we have another interesting demographic crashing into this, and that's where we look at baby boomers who are actually part of what they call the silver tsunami that we're expecting over the next 20 years. As baby boomers exit the job market and move on to either their last opportunity for home ownership or uh, the opportunity to move into assisted living or a nursing home. And so as they retire, immigrants are going to be crucial to filling the jobs that these folks have vacated and uh, the job openings promoting growth in the labor market. So that's gonna be something that we're gonna be watching as a trend for sure. Let's do a little check on chat, see what's happening up here. Uh, Mary Jane just had a comment about the Italian population missing Polish heritage, and she said that with a smile, you're half and half. Okay, half Italian, half Polish. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm half Italian and half Irish, and so you can imagine, uh, for those of you who fall on either side of the spectrum, and where I was raised in suburban New Jersey, 
everybody that I knew was one, the other, or both. And so Irish and Italian makes for a pretty schizophrenic upbringing. There was a lot of yelling and a lot of raised voices, but it was pretty happy noise. So kind of interesting. And um, Kathy said, isn't this study blending generational boomers with ethnicity? It actually does. There's a lot of over overlapping statistical information, Kathy. I'm glad you asked that. A lot of overlapping information when it comes to both the demographic and what they call the psychographic birds of a feather, the people who do the same things and have the same buying patterns, the same patterns as consumers. Uh, and there's lots of overlap in that. And they always look for that intersection. But that's a very good question. So that we're looking at the generations. We look at the generational influence. And now in this particular glance that we're taking at this, we're looking at the immigrant populations and how they have affected uh, the country. So the baby boomers really are the ones who are affecting the immigrant populations by retiring from jobs that may ultimately be going to people who are immigrants. So let's cross over not so much to look at religion necessary, necessarily, but let's take a look. And uh, once again, I'm going to open chat because I want to ask you guys a question and I would love to see your answers. My question is, would you agree that 9-11 changed everything in the United States? And if you don't agree, I'm already seeing lots of yeses, thank you. If you don't agree, tell me what your perspective is on that. Yeah, nobody's disagreeing. Uh, so somebody, oh, let's see. Patricia O'Brien, you said, I think so. Why do you think so? Say, say a little bit more about that. If you have something that would, that would make you say that it isn't that different. Not everything, airline travel, safety, trust, Becky said. Um, and safety and trust are huge. And uh, Nick said he's not sure what it changed. Well, airline travel, safety and trust for starters. And, uh, and I think it changed our perspective on what I would like to call the concept of other. Because we as a people and we as human beings, I really do believe that, that frequently people are looking at a concept of other. Kathy said it certainly changed attitudes toward Muslims, unfortunately. I agree. And it did because people were painted with a very broad brush after 9-11 that changed how we viewed Arab Americans who were born and raised in this country. People who were Arab immigrants but had lived here peacefully for a long time and had nothing to do with the circumstances of 9-11. And the Muslim population was tremendously, tremendously impacted by this because they were looked at with suspicion and fear in a way that they never had been before. And so where we have approximately three and a half million Arab Americans living in the United States, it's very interesting. If you talk with people within the Arab American community, you will often find that they are not Muslim. There are seven million American Muslims living in the United States, but not all of them are from the Arab countries and not all Arab Americans are Muslim. So uh, we have people within our own country who are one, the other, both, but uh, in our own company, I should say, uh, but not necessarily Arab American, Muslim, doesn't always go together. And so even though Islam is one of the fastest growing religions in the United States, um, another of the fastest growing religions in the United States is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Interesting, those two. But Islam is definitely one of the fastest growing. And Muslims actually comprise 0.9% of the United States population. So that's a relatively small number. Christianity, by comparison, people who claim to be Christian are 70.6%, almost 71% of the population. And Judaism has 1.9%. So that just gives you a little bit of a snapshot that of the three primary religions, and granted, Christianity, Christianity envelops any number of denominations, but, uh, but we still have a substantial Muslim population, and they are, unfortunately, 
among the groups of people who are experiencing some pretty extreme prejudice right now, and it comes out in fair housing. And we have had incidents within our company of people being um, shouted at while they're showing houses to Muslim persons. And they have uh, experienced people saying very unkind things to their clients. And it's not only uncomfortable, it's inexcusable. That can be taken as a threat or interference to someone's fair housing rights, which is completely against the law. And if you ever encounter something like that based on either someone's ethnicity, their faith, or any other aspect of the protected classes, you really must help people report that and make sure that that information is in their hands to get um, that kind of concern to the proper authorities. And first of all, get everybody to safety because somebody who's crazy enough to yell something like that is crazy enough to try to do something about it. But we do encounter it. In our states, it's kind of interesting. The states that our footprint covers don't include the one state that has popped to the top of having uh, the highest level of Muslim population, and that's New Jersey, with 3% of its population of the Muslim faith. New York is right behind, though, and we have many, many offices in New York. And uh, that is 2% of the Muslim population. Ohio, Michigan, and Pennsylvania each have approximately 1% Muslim population. And it's kind of interesting. If we look at the cities that this pertains to, and we take a look at where people are, um, dropping to the bottom of what you see on the screen, Columbus, Ohio, and Dearborn, Michigan actually are the two cities in, in uh, the country that have the highest Muslim population. Columbus, Ohio, though, again, I said that not everyone was both Arab American and Muslim. Columbus has a Somali population of people who came in here as refugees during the time of the terrible wars in Somalia. And so people came in and were taken in by church groups and were helped to get established in Columbus. And so if you're on from our Columbus markets, you're familiar with the, uh, the many businesses that have popped up to serve the Somali community. And uh, it is now the second largest Som Somali population. The first is in Minnesota. But all of those folks who came in found residence and comfort here based on their need to emigrate from a country that was being torn apart by war. In Dearborn, Michigan, it's where we're going to find the largest population of uh, what a TV show once called All American Muslims. I don't know if you recall that show. It was on a couple of years ago on uh, TLC, the Learning Channel. And I always find that kind of interesting, whether we're learning about Honey Boo Boo or All American Muslims, it is the Learning Channel. And that show was a really interesting bird's eye view into the everyday lives of people of the Muslim faith, of the Islamic faith, who were born and raised in Dearborn and what they were encountering specifically after 9-11. And so if you have an opportunity to look back and see if you can find some of those episodes on uh, YouTube, I'm not sure if they're on there, but <clears throat> it would be worthwhile to take a look at it because basically you will see a community much like any other American community of people who know, like, and trust each other, except that they are very heterogene uh, homogeneous. They are really much of the same group of folks and they're in Dearborn. Our Michigan markets that adjoin uh, the Dearborn and Detroit areas encounter a lot of people from that market frequently as clients. And so uh, those, are, those are a couple of interesting examples. According to what we knew in the 2000 census, so this goes back uh, 20 years ago, California, Michigan, New York, Florida, and New Jersey had 31% of the uh, Muslim population in the country. And so that's, that's kind of interesting. And again, that's been updated. And uh, also the counties that contained the greatest populations of Arab Americans included those in California, Michigan, New York, Florida, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and there we add Virginia. So really our entire footprint has representation of the Arab and Muslim co populations. And it does make a difference. Does anybody have, an experience of working with someone in the Muslim community or in another community that is what you would describe as a diverse community. Um, let's see if we can go to chat and see some talk that's going on there. 
Um, Susan, thank you. That is, it is the holy month of Ramadan in the, in the Islamic faith. And uh, in the 60s, that's right, Roman, in the 60s, Parma, Ohio was dubbed the Polish capital of Ohio because it was such a popular location for people who uh, were migrating to this country to settle among people that they felt got them. Because if you think about it, why do people want to migrate toward areas where other people are like them? I think it's because nobody wants to be thought of as other, as different than. There is certainly a comfort zone. Um, and Sharon said, uh, Ukraine, it is Ukrainian. Let's see. Uh, Laura said, yes, I volunteer with refugees from the Democratic Republic of Congo here in Pittsburgh. That's terrific. And uh, Sarah said, I've worked with clients from India. They had specific things for their home that you uh, may not usually see traditionally. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think that is true of Asian Indians and of many other uh, people who come from various Asian countries, from Feng Shui right through the direction in which the front door must face. And that can be really, really terrific. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Denise has been working with clients from Nepal. And so if you guys don't mind, please send me some you know, little paragraphs about how you feel about working with people from diverse backgrounds. I would love to hear your experience. Utica, New York, the largest city in the market was deemed one of six refugee cities by the United, in the United States. And um, so uh, Jay says, as an Arab American myself, I'm proud to work with many Muslim families throughout my community. Jay, thank you. Uh, that was from Jay Grow, <coughs> excuse me, who is Another of our fair housing advocates in upstate New York, like Susan and like Margaret Hartman, we have lots and lots of people who are avidly working to make sure that fair housing permeates the New York market. Helen said that she has worked with, uh, Helen Geisloid has worked with Muslim clients in the Akron Canton area of Ohio. And so send me some notes about that. I'd love to know what it is that you're doing and what you see as a changing face of diversity in your markets in the future. Who's coming in now that wasn't there before? I would love to know about that. <clears throat> okay, so let's see. Oh, somebody just said that uh, Roman said he showed a home to uh, Asian Indians who had an altar in a closet. Yes, that shrines within the home are very typical. And Rochester has uh, new agents from Turkey, Australia, Bhutan, and Nigeria. Thank you, Maggie. That's great. We've got a League of Nations right within our own Fast Start group. That's terrific. Uh, Susan said, my Muslim clients have generously shared a table with, with her in the past with food and customs. I'll take a minute and tell you guys a funny story. When I was first actively selling in the market of Cleveland Heights, Ohio, which is known to be a very, very diverse community and a very successfully diverse community, I was hosting an open house one Sunday and I looked out the front door, it had a glass uh, front door and I looked out the door and saw two very large men barreling toward the front door like they really had business to conduct. And they came into the house and it turned out that they were brothers from Lebanon who had been living in the United States for quite some time. Their uh, last name was Shalhoub and they were working with uh, no one at that point to find a home for their parents. So they were shopping realtors and they were shopping houses. And so I talked to them for a while, they were delightful. And they said that their parents had just come over, it was at a point in history back in the 1980s when uh, Lebanon was completely war-torn. And so they had barely gotten their parents out successfully and brought them here. So they invited me to come to their home. Um, they had kind of a compound in the area where this open house was being held. And they were looking to see what house might be right for their parents so that they could all stay within the same neighborhood and care for their aging parents as time went on. So I went to one of the brothers' homes and the entire extended family was there. And uh, their, Mr. and Mrs. Shalhoub were there and they, they didn't speak a word of English. And so it was all about eye contact and kind vibes going back and forth among us. And we had sisters-in-law, the brothers' wives, bustling in the background, doing some food and beverage preparation. And one of the sisters-in-law brought out this beautiful silver uh, coffee service with demitasse cups and beautiful little uh, spoons. And I was poured a cup of coffee 
that was the darkest, thickest cup of coffee I have ever seen in my lifetime. And I'm somebody who drinks coffee like melted coffee ice cream. And so I looked at it and I was like, where's the sugar? Where's the cream? And Mr. Shalhoub started nodding at me to just drink it as it was. And I thought, I don't think I can. It's very strong. I can tell that. And then everybody around me started just like using the coffee cups as shots. They were just downing this coffee in one fell swoop. So I followed suit. It went straight to my head with a buzz of caffeine. But at the end of that ritual that seemed very important to the family, Mrs. Shalhoub, the matriarch, took my coffee cup, turned it over, and read the grounds. And that was a tradition that apparently gave them the okay that I was all right for them to work with. And she turned, it was like that old commercial, uh, you know, Alexa Hete approves, there is rejoicing. She turned to her family and nodded, and that was it. And uh, before I actively um, moved into a different area of real estate and away from sales, I had sold that family four houses over a number of years. And so I think that it, it really illustrates for us that the more that we can build bridges with a diverse clientele, especially an ethnically diverse clientele, and understand their ways and their preferences and the things that are important to them, the better we will all be for that. Um, really interesting. And uh, it's, it, it, yeah, Susan said the coffee grounds sound like tea leaves. I think that's exactly what it was like, Susan. And I just kind of sat there marveling at the entire thing. So take note of what's happening in your communities and stay in touch with me about it. I think I mentioned last week that there's a very good book that has been something of a diversity Bible for real estate practitioners over the years. And it's called Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands. You can get it used or new on Amazon, and it is just terrific. It gets updated and, and um, reissued every so often. And so if you are working with diverse markets, really, especially like Nepal and, and places that are not the typical markets that we have typically had clients from, by all means, get your hands on that. Go online. There's a plethora of information online and find out what those diverse realms may be that we need to know more about. And please give us some guidance. So if we just look back over the past 10 years between 2010 and 2020, I just wanted to give you guys a snapshot of the things that we have lived through in this country, not even from 1620 to 2020, from when the slaves first arrived now. But in the past 10 years, we've had the election of the first black president of the United States. We've had a call for an outright ban on Muslims entering our country. We have had migrant crises and a call to build a wall at the Mexican border. We've been through world shaking events. We're in the middle of one now, including Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street. We've seen the birth of Black Lives Matter and Me Too. We've seen the rise of bots making those robo calls on our phones and providing social media disinformation campaigns. We've seen the revolution in how Americans regard gender and gender identity and sexual orientation. We've seen gun rights protests, school shootings, and violent attacks in houses of worship, some of those within millimeters of our own offices. And we've swung back in recent years to a traditional call, uh, to a call for traditional American values, whatever those are. And we have had people looking for legislation that will protect religious rights and expressions. But as we talked about last week with where do my rights end and yours begin, and where do my rights begin to infringe on your rights, I think that's something that we really need to take a look at. So on a slightly lighter note, I have one more thing that I want to go through with you today, and then we're going to cover some things that we'll look at next week. And it starts with this concept of niche marketing and faith-based marketing. Now, you probably would have to get really close to your screens to be able to see the fine print on this. But I did a web search, and I update it every so often just to see what's there for niche and faith-based marketing. And this is the, the first uh, website that came up. This is a company called Kingdom Real Estate Address. That is actually the brokerage name. And they identify themselves as Christian realtors serving you in every city in the grand USA. 
And so this is very interesting. The couple that owns this particular site is over here on the right. And uh, they say that they are a Christ-centered network of Christian realtors located throughout the grand United States, all buyers and sellers, and they emphasize all. So they express their faith, but emphasize that they want to work with everyone, receive honesty, integrity, and the truth throughout their real estate transaction. Kingdom Real Estate Address agents faithfully serve your residential real estate needs with excellent service through Christ. So it's very interesting. And then they, they go on to quote the Bible and they quote a number of things that are based in their faith. But um, I, I have to ask you, would you feel comfortable personally working with a company that expressed their faith views so specifically in their marketing? Or how about this one? This one is from ldsagents.com. This one has been around for a very long time. And it has had um, it has had some traction over the years, and it's really they've had some really cute websites. They say that they have three thousand LDS Mormon agents throughout the country. What I have never been able to find out about this one is if they let people who are not Mormon agents become members of their network. Same thing with the previous one. Um, and uh, Laura said no, I wouldn't work with them. Period. Kathleen said no, she would not work with them. What about the rest of you? How would you feel about this if you came across this kind of a website in your search for a home? Um, somebody says, I, defer, I prefer to be neutral on all fronts. I think you're saying that as a practitioner, Liz, it does not appeal to Kate. Uh, Tony said definitely no. Okay, so let's go forward a little bit. And it's kind of interesting because this, this ends up being an interesting um, foray. This is a faith-based marketing ad for a woman who is of the, of the Islamic faith, and you can see that she's wearing the hijab, the traditional head garb. Now, if you were a member of a community that had experienced what the Muslim community has experienced, would that change your feeling about that? And I have to uh, make note here, persons who are of the Muslim faith also have a requirement when it comes to mortgages that their mortgage loans have to be very specific and really have to be by someone in their community um, because they cannot pay interest as we understand interest. And so there would almost be a faith imperative. Now, Mary Jane said something interesting. Um, Mary Jane said she would not want to be part of any of these organizations because each of us take a, a position, hopefully, to work with all qualified persons with respect and once we know more, we are more. I think that's a very beautiful way of expressing a very pluralistic perspective. Um, Jay said, this may be an unpopular question, but as a member of the LGBT population, I looked for, oh, you're just zipping away from me there, Jay, hang on. Um, hold on one second. Uh, let me just go up here for a second so I can capture that. Oh, I seem to have lost it, but Jay, I saw your question and I know here we go, wait a second. Of the, as a member of the LGBTQ population, I worked for another member of the community when I bought my house in Florida, and there was a network. Well, um, actually, that's, that's interesting that you would say that, Jay. We're going to cover uh, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning community next week. That is one of the things that we're gonna be covering, and we're going to talk about this exact topic. So if you, if you don't mind, I'll just defer that one till next week's discussion. And uh, Michael said, if they can be truly neutral, great, but I'm very skeptical. Me too, Michael. Um, now, I think there's a difference. I think that the difference lies in one of the folks in this group, one of the members, you know, the first one that we saw with uh, Kingdom Real Estate Address, saying that they offered fair and equitable service to everyone, as opposed to the people who are specifically like this one, targeting the community with which they want to work. And so um, I, I think that it's very difficult to do. And uh, Kath, Kate said, in San Diego, I do know that Chinese buyers almost always use Chinese agents. Well, think about this, and that is probably true. And we have a number of Chinese agents in our own company who also work with people. But think about the language barrier that a real estate transaction can present. You know, if you, if you look at it from a perspective of just how complex our language can be in the first place, now add on all the real estate jargon. How do you say FISBO in Chinese? 
And if you can say it in Chinese, can you say it in one of how many dialects? You know, so it's it's a really interesting discussion. And uh, and I'd love to have more of it with you. Oh, Maggie said you say it FISBO. Maggie lived in China for a while. Thank you, Maggie. And so um, so it's interesting, but the language barrier is a huge thing. And so if any of you speak another language and have not yet put that linguistic specialty on our Howard Hanna homepage under with your, you know, your specific website, which will go into a repository that's shown on our homepage for anybody who's seeking a certain language and help in deciphering the complexity of a real estate transaction, you can be a help with that and you should be. Jay, to your point, this is what I found when I put in gay real estate, the Gay Realty Network and an organization called Nagle Rep. Uh, the National Association of Gay and Lesbian Real Estate Professionals. And uh, they had videos of gay real estate. I thought that was kind of interesting. I'm not sure exactly what gay real estate per se looks like, but, but it's, uh, it's now very popular. What we used to see as recently as about five years ago is that the gay real estate groups that, that form these networks were sometimes very problematic on the World Wide Web. Because what happens is that certain populations, and the gay community was often among them, um, are very shy about outing themselves. And so during a period in our history where gay, gay realtors did not necessarily want to be known as being gay or were not fully out in their own communities, so they had some challenges with um, promoting themselves on this time, type of a network, they would frequently have websites that were set up so that all you would ever see of the gay agent was his or her first name. And then you basically clicked into what they call a vow, where you, the client, would have to give more information about yourself in order to get complete information about that agent. The problem we have with that is that any time that an agent's full name and company are not together, chances are really good that you're violating equal prominence requirements in almost any state. And so that became one of those worldwide web distinctions that really, you know, had some challenges attached to it. So, uh, so that has been improved. And now pretty much if you go into any of these uh, gay networks or uh, lesbian networks, you'll see that people are represented as exactly who they are, whether or not they're a member of the gay community. Some people are just gay friendly and more than willing to, uh, to work with everybody who comes their way. So next week, we're going to hit more into religion in America. You know, I took a Claren D this morning. I hope that my, my spring allergies do not continue to plague me next week. I apologize again for that. We'll talk about persons with disabilities. Actually, right now, the number one most uh, discriminated against group in our country. And we'll talk about sexual orientation and gender identity. Gender identity right now is being covered uh, in legal cases under the heading of sex, the federally protected class. Sexual orientation, with very few exceptions, uh, is not. And so uh, not under federal protections anywhere and in very few of the states. In our network, it's uh, pretty much New York and pending in Virginia on statewide protections. We'll talk about the questions that you have raised about service dogs, emotional support animals, and disparate impact. And we'll talk about what's in the headlines and on the court dockets right now. And uh, so Michael said that his allergies are acting up today too. It's pouring rain. There shouldn't be any pollen around here. I don't know what's going on in Cleveland. But uh, please stay in touch with me, gang. I want to talk with you more about the things that you would like to talk about and the things that, um, that we really do need to cover when it comes to any aspects of what we're talking about in this series. And so if you uh, email me, it's JackieCasera at HowardHanna.com. And if you shoot me a quick email and just let me know topically what you would be most interested in hearing, let me just check to see. Um, I don't see anything else in the Q&A, but uh, let's see in the chat. It's mostly just everyone saying so long for now. So thank you all. And, um, and I really appreciate you being with us for this. Thank you for bearing with my voice. And I will look forward to seeing all of you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.